Hi, I'm Matthew Schwartz, Executive Editor with Information Security Media Group. I'm talking ransomware with Raj Simani of Intel Security. Raj, you are a cybersecurity advisor to Europol. At Intel Security, you've also done a lot of research into recent attack trends. And one of the things I'd like to start off talking about, if we may, is ransomware. You've seen some interesting developments lately. Yeah. So, so actually, you know, late last year, we did um, analysis with the Cyber Threat Alliance on CryptoWall version three. Um, and we released the research on Wednesday. A week later, guess what we saw? Version Nothing. four. Version four. Yeah. And it was quite incredible because the amount of money they made, well, was at least 325 million US dollars. And we had to peel back 40 layers of obfuscation. You know, we had to try to determine that by you know, analysis of the ultimate payment wallets. Now, you kind of ask yourself a question, say, well, all right, 325 million US dollars, that's a lot of money. Well, what are they doing with that? And the truth is, is I mean, I'm guessing there's lots of parties, <laughs> but beyond the parties, actually, there's reinvestment and re-innovation. Um, 48 hours ago, actually, we just published a blog called, uh, actually, and doing analysis into manual and targeted ransomware attacks. Uh, and actually, what we found was the level of investment has actually gone in directly into innovating the next version or next iteration of ransomware. It's really quite, I mean, we talk about a game of cat and mouse, but that's what we're talking about. And what they've done, because historically what they will have is they will have an encryption key and a decryption key per family. So, for example, when, you know, when the Dutch police took down CoinVault, you know, they managed to seize the C2 infrastructure, extract the decryption key, and then... If you were infected with this, you could get the decryption key free of charge and then decrypt all your data. They're now encrypting data per file individually. And so what are the challenges associated with attempting to decrypt a system like that? Is it even possible? Well, if you pay, I'm assuming that they would decrypt it. I didn't want to say that part because we, no. we know a lot of people do pay, obviously. No, but you know, but you like, so, so I gave an interview the other day. And in a micro perspective, by actually paying the ransomware, you get your data back. But with variants that we've seen, like I think it was Tesla Crypt, for example, the author behind that, what what I'm assuming it's a he, but what, what he would do was he would then base the next um, campaign against his experience about who pays the most. So I'll give you an example. So uh, Tesla Crypt, CTB Locker, Crypto Wall, three of the biggest families that we've seen for some time. Which country is in the top three of all of them? Well, actually, which country is number one? It's USA, right? Yeah. Right, congratulations. You Thank win. you. Thank you very yeah, much. Yeah, yeah. You'll get an Oscar for that. <laughs> I suspect you can get an Oscar. I probably couldn't. Um, but no, but, what, but in, in the UK, for example, you know, dis, we're actually quite a small country. You know, we're disproportionately, but we, 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 we were targeted. We were in the top three of all of them, which is a disproportionate number of people that are targeted. Now, why is that? Psychological proclivity to pay ransoms? Well, here's the interesting thing. There was a study that done that talked about who's actually paid ransomware. Mm. Now, United States citizens have paid ransomware, I think it was 50% of the time. So half of all people who've been targeted tend to pay up? Who've been infected. Who've been infected with ransomware. Have been okay. paid up. Who's number two? Great Britain, 44%. Mm. So all of a sudden you have this, you know, you have United States and UK paying the most. And then you have which countries are targeted the most? United States and UK. Mm -hmm. So if you go out and pay, you may well get your data, but all you're ending up doing is just reaffirming to the author that actually targeting you in the first place was a good idea. And they made 325 million US dollars. By the way, that is horribly conservative. Um, they made at least 325 million US dollars. What they did was they reinvested, they innovated, and now they've got a new platform, which means our response as an industry, which is if we get the keys, we make it available free of charge, almost negates that, that, that approach. Mm -hmm. So basically, if you pay, you're enabling their market research. You're also funding the next generation of ransomware. Now, you use the term targeted ransomware. So are we seeing attacks? How, how exactly are they being targeted? Is that what we've been discussing in terms of the kinds of populations you want to go after? Or are you seeing them get even more targeted? For example, like the Hollywood Hospital. It's never been targeted. It's always been a scattergun approach. Um, you know, historically, what would happen is, is if you wanted to go out and do a ransomware campaign, 
I mean, you know, my, my daughter can do it. I mean, that's how simple it is. Me, meaning t- teenager, toddler? Like, like young, not even teenager. Yeah. Because here's the thing. If you want to do a ransomware campaign, what do you need to know? Well, actually nothing, because all you need to do is enter the CAPTCHA to register for the ransomware as a service portal, and then they will generate the campaign for you, and it will cost you 20%, roughly about 20% of your profits. So it's really been a scattergun approach, but now ransomware is a growth industry, and so now what they're doing is they're specifically targeting organizations. Well, if one gang can earn maybe $325 million at least, 20% of that is not a bad haul. Well, yeah, so we've got to be careful. So, you know, it's not like the old days. The old days would be there is somebody going and targeting your organization, and actually the number of actors involved between attacker and victim was probably a one, to, you know, like a direct relationship. But now what happens is is that you've got multiple different parties involved with regards to the cybercrime campaign. They will outsource particular components. They will have, you know, even the laundering aspects. I mean, just this morning, Europol announced 154 mules. I think it was 154 money mules used in a particular laundering application. Mm-hmm. And so actually the number of people involved in a, in, in, in a fairly big campaign can be relatively high. Then we've got the kind of low end stuff, which is the ransomware as a service portals. And that is, I go in, log in, select, you know, buy a bunch of email addresses. Email addresses cost how much? Pennies. About $5 for about a couple of thousand. Mm-hmm. Right, you can buy them on commercial auction sites, by the way. Oh, very good. Yeah. Um, and they'll just go out and send the emails out and trick people into doing it. Cybercrime economy at work. This is, this is, this is an economy, this is an industry. This is a growth industry. Um, you know, people aren't, I've said this a million times, right? People aren't robbing banks with guns. They're using USB sticks and malware. And it's safer. I know which one I'd rather do if I was in the I mean, business. I, you know what? Yeah. I, well, I mean, if you're a criminal, of course, because, you know, you've got the, you've got the opportunity to hide in jurisdictions which, which may not have extradition treaties with the country in which you're in. You physically don't even have to leave your bedroom, let alone the country. And the person that you're communicating with or the person that you're trying to coerce, you know, may be in a country that you'll never visit. So, you know, you are kind of, I've said this before, which is, you know, we're finding a 21st century problem with 20th century tools. In other words, the way that we are as an industry, uh, not as an industry, but as a society, is we've got these these lines drawn or drawn around pieces of land, and you know, police can't go into that particular jurisdiction, and you know, we've got MLATs and so forth to be able to try to address that. But that is the challenge that we face: is we're fighting a crime which has no respect for geographical boundaries. And it's going to take a lot of treaties to try to catch up, obviously. I, I remember Team America. Maybe we'll have like World Police or something. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, we've got, um, you've got uh, the Joint Cybercrime Action Task Force. Mm-hmm. Um, and as you can guess, I'm a big fan of what the work that Euro- the European Cybercrime Centre does. And there is an example, a shining example of the way that law enforcement are working with each other to do deconfliction, but equally are collaborating and working with private sector to be able to target this issue. Um, you know, and we're, we're here at this RSA conference, and I was pretty depressed yesterday, actually. But, you know, one of the really good things that we have about our industry is, you know, we are collaborating, we are working together, we are making arrests, we are doing takedowns. We are a long way away from actually where we need to be as an industry because, you know, I don't know if people really fundamentally understand, you know, when you get it hit by a botnet or you get a ransomware attack or, you know, you have information stolen, whether it really matters, but this stuff really is important. Raj? Thanks very much for your time. Hey, no problem. Thank you. For Information Security Media Group, I'm Matthew Schwartz. Thanks for joining us.